Everybody good? Amen. All right. So I got to change that, by the way. My son reprimanded me last night. If you want to turn to Proverbs chapter 3, you can. My son reprimanded me. I said, you coming to church? He said, yeah, I'll be at church. And I said, okay, I'm looking forward to a good one. He said, better be a good one. I said, well, you know what's going to happen. He's like, I know exactly what's going to happen. Like, what do you mean you know exactly what's going to happen? He said, you're going to walk out, you're going to clap. And you're going to say, good morning. And then you're going to say, everybody good? And I said, is it that obvious? He said, it's that obvious. And I'm like, you think I should change it up? He said, I think you should change it up. I said, you got any suggestions? He said, yep. So we're going to try it this morning. But I have to explain it. Luckily, in the first service, most people knew. How many of you have ever watched professional wrestling? All right. Good, good. Some of you have, and we'll pray about that. <laughs> but there is a professional wrestler, I would say an iconic professional wrestler, named Ric Flair. <laughs> you already know. For those of you who have no idea who Ric Flair is, this is the noise he makes. <laughs> Good. So my son, this was, this was your pastor's child's recommendation for changing the opening of Real Life Church. He said, you need to just come out and say, good morning. Let them say, good morning. And then say, everybody give me two claps and a Ric Flair. Okay? <laughs> hold on. Hold on. So we're going to try it. We're going to try it. All right? So back his whole thing up. <laughs> Worship ends. Hey, good morning, Real Life. Hey, give me two claps and a Ric Flair. <laughs> kind of dig that. <laughs> kind of like that. Boy, if you're a guest this morning, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not, but I hope you come back. We try to have a good time here at Real Life Church. We are in a series called Proverbs right now where we are walking through some things. And one of the things that I've noticed is that I am compulsive about a few things. Not everything, but a few things. That, for example, me coming out, clapping my hands, good morning, everybody good? Like that, say, like you could go back through. They also have a video of me somewhere of me taking my table and moving it. I don't need to move it. It doesn't do anything but sit here, and that's why I go through so many. It's why I tear the tops off of them, because I just can't help but fidget with this table, okay? It's a compulsion that I have. If I stand at the table, it will nearly spin all the way around during a service, because I just can't help but mess with it. I also have a compulsion where in the morning when I wake up, I have to go. I, I don't mean I have to go, but... <laughs> I mean, I do, but like... I have, to, I have to leave. Like, when I get ready, like, if I get ready, I got to go. I got to leave. I got to get out. I got to. And so I don't know where this came from. There are days I have nothing to do. But if I get up and get ready, I get in my truck and just drive around. Like, that's weird, Vince. I know. But it also has become, my compulsiveness has become an issue in my marriage at times, because if I get ready, and Jennifer is not quite ready, and we're in one vehicle, which we most of the time take two vehicles everywhere. We will leave at the same time in two different vehicles, not because we don't love each other, but because I've already drove her nuts. <laughs> Anybody relate? And so like, if I'm ready, which fellas, let's, I, it doesn't take me that long. I'll, be in, I'll walk in, she'll be in the bathroom. I'll just look in there while she's fixing her hair. And then I just pace. I just walk around the house. I'll walk back in a few minutes later. And then she'll, while she's straightening her hair, be like, you can go. I'm like, well, it's, it's, it's okay. It's okay. If you're, if you're close, I'll just ride with you. You can just go. Okay, good, 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 because then I can control what I'm going to do. I don't know why I do it. I wish I knew, other than it's a compulsion that I have. Strangely enough, I don't have it in everything. Like, I can't really grow a beard. I, I've tried. You're like, I don't think you've tried. I've tried, literally. I haven't shaved since July. Okay, that's not true. <laughs> 
It's August. It was August. So um, I can't. It just, if it grows in, I look like I'm sick. I look like I have the mange. Um, <laughs> and so like, I, but I don't think about it. It's, it's horrible looking, but I don't think about it. And so I'll go up. I just want to shave. I'll get up, get ready. Every, I'll take a shower. I'll do everything else. I just want to shave. And usually on Saturdays, I get a reminder, hey, are you going to clean this up before tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I better do that. I don't know why I can't remember a basic thing like shaving my face, but every morning I have to get up and drive a lap around Mountain Home or my day is weird. I'm compulsive. And as I was praying about this, I'm like, God, could you help me be more compulsive about the things of you? Because I don't find myself real compulsive about those things either. Anybody with me on that? Like some of you have to have the same cup of coffee every morning, but you struggle reading your Bible regularly or, or struggle praying regularly or set time. And so as I'm reading through these Proverbs, God has really been convicting me about this whole idea of Solomon meeting with his son and having this conversation with his son, meeting with his son, having this conversation with his son. And he's, he's in again, chapter three of Proverbs has one of the most popular, if not the most popular proverb in it of all Proverbs, Okay. So it's a really popular one that we see here that's happening. And what I'm going to pray for you today is that the lessons that Solomon gives us, Lord, help us be compulsive about these. Help us, help us put these into our disciplines and into our daily walk to where we have to do these things. And so I got to get it rolling. Here we go. First thing is this. First verse, starting with chapter 3, verse 1. My son, do not forget my teaching. But let your heart keep my commandments for the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Length of days, length of years, and peace will be added to you if you do what? Don't forget and keep my commandments. Don't forget what I teach you and keep the commandments that I've taught you. If you will do those things, don't forget, don't forget. If you'll do those things, you'll live longer, you'll live healthier, and you'll have peace. Like, is, can the Bible really say that? Yeah, Solomon's just taking this off the Ten Commandments where it says, Obey thy, honor thy father and thy mother. If you do this, long will be your days on the earth. It's a promise, it's a, it's a scriptural promise that God is saying, like, hey, there's, there are physical blessings to following God. There are physical blessings to following God. And so Solomon kind of starts his son off by giving him this big, big overarching picture. And he's not done yet because he gets into verse three and four and five and six, and it's still kind of part of this big picture. And so he leans in right now in verse three and four, and he says, hey, I want you to get this. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, but bind them around your neck Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success, good reputation in the sight of God and man. Let steadfast love and faithfulness, this is a phrase that would have been very popular in the Hebrew culture, this idea of God being steadfast and faithful, steadfast and faithful. He is consistently faithful at what? At love. He is consistently faithful all the time he's there. And if you will live in that, how do I do that? You put it around your neck and you write it down in your heart. It's really interesting phrasing here because what Solomon is telling him, his son is this. Put it on where people can see it in your life. But write it down in your heart, down on the inside part of your life so that it can be lived out. Because you can fake it. How many of you know people can fake it? Say Amen. You can fake it. And Solomon goes, I don't want you to just put it around your neck. Because there's a lot of people that can fake that stuff. There's a lot of people that can come across as spiritual. The Bible even says it. Not all who say hey, unto me, Lord, Lord, are going to enter in. Why? Because there's a lot of people that can fake it. But I also want you to write it down on the tablets of your heart. I want it inside you, son. I, it's got to not just be a lesson and a head nod. I need you to really get what I'm saying to you. So we have this immediate moment where Solomon is going, there's an outward expression of an inward decision. There's an outward expression of an inward decision. Inwardly, we're writing it on our hearts. Outwardly, we're binding it around our necks. 
But he doesn't stop there because then he gets into verses five and six, which again is the most popular proverb that there is. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Beautiful verse. Anybody have that on a calendar or a coffee mug somewhere? Most, most of you probably do. It's like the verse of the day every other day. It just pops up. Why? Because it's just so stinking good. And it is really, really good. I'm going to touch on it back at the end of this service because it's so good. And it really is a great summary of all that I'm about to say to you. But Solomon kind of starts off with it and goes, hey, just like I said about binding it around your neck and writing it in your heart, I'm going to give you another way to look at it. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Not just your Sunday heart, not just your Wednesday night heart, not just your life group heart, all of your heart. What do you mean all of your heart? I mean your job heart, I mean your school heart, I mean your finances heart, I mean your relationship heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, this is where we see a shift. All your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. This is the same kind of rhythm that he gives us in the verses above it when he says, outward expression, inward decision. Inward decision in verse five is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Outward expression in all of your ways, acknowledge him. Say, what is this? This is how I wrote it down. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, that's your belief. How many of you believe you should trust in the Lord with all your heart? Say amen. Yeah, it's a pretty easy one. That's, that's like Sunday School 101. If, I, if you're asking me what I believe, I believe you should trust in the Lord with all your heart. That's awesome. The problem that most of us have is not with belief. It's with taking our belief and downloading it deep enough into our heart that it becomes our behaviors. And that's what he says next. Your belief has to be straight. That's right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But the behavior part, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. So I need it to just, I need it to not just be something that you say you do, I need to be something that you do. I need it not to just be, uh, I speak Jesus over my family on Sunday morning, but then I curse them when they don't get ready for school on time. Church, we live in a world that believes a bunch of stuff or says they believe a bunch of stuff and their behaviors speak contrary to it. Because here's the thing. I, I watch a lot of people raise their hands in worship. But when I'm really watching people is Thursday afternoon or Tuesday morning in the car line because I want to make sure that that belief is being lived out in a behavior of their life. Because two reasons. First, I'm really sick and tired of Christians being called hypocrites. Any of y'all that just get old? If Christians really live it the way they're supposed to live it, this coming from a person who doesn't know what we're supposed to live a lot of times. But I need, I need my behaviors to be a reflection of my belief. Or then I can't get mad if somebody calls me a hypocrite. And so Solomon is telling his son the same thing. He's like, hey, I want you to trust the Lord with everything you have, but I need, I need you to really lean in on this part. I need you to get this part. That in your ways you acknowledge him, then he'll make your path clear. He'll make the path straight. He'll, he'll let you know where your next step needs to be. And most of us, that's all we really want. It's not, I don't need God to show me everything around the corner. I'd just be really happy, Kyle, if I knew what my next step was supposed to be. God, if you'll be faithful in showing me the next step, I'll follow you anywhere. He says, okay, in all your ways, acknowledge me. I'll do that. Trust me with all your heart. Yeah, I do, God. I love you on Sundays. No, I need you to love me with your spouse and with your children and with your relationships and in your job and in your finances and in your home. I need you to trust me with all of it. But, but God, I, I, I'm pretty good at this area. No, 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 I need you to trust me with all of it and then live it out and then I'll make your path clear. And I think he's telling his son this and his son looks at him, he's like, dad, that's really great, big advice. Focus on God, trust in God. How do I do that? 
How do I do that? And then Solomon shifts and brings it into an inward focus to his son. He's like, hey, this is what I need you to do. This is how you live out what I just told you. First thing I want you to do is simply this. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Be not wise in your own eyes. Okay, how do I do that? By fearing the Lord, turning away from evil. Check this out. Just, this, is, this is the result of that statement. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Y'all didn't hear that. How many of you, un, let me ask it this way. How many of you ever heard of worry and stress and anxiety? How many of you struggle with worry, stress, and anxiety? Okay. How many of you know that worry, stress, and anxiety have a physical symptom at times. Yeah, here, here I, I, I went to the World Wide Web. <laughs> I didn't WebMD because I wanted you all to make it out of here today. <laughs> this is what it says. Worry, stress, and anxiety can cause many physical symptoms, including cardiovascular symptoms, a fast, irregular, or strong heartbeat, also known as palpitations. Respiratory problems, rapid breathing, also known as hyperventilation, gastrointestinal, nausea, diarrhea, stomach pain, or a churning feeling in your stomach. Am I hitting anybody yet? Musculoskeletal, muscle aches, tension, trembling, or jitterness, neurological issues, dizziness, lightheadedness, pins and needles, tingling in the hands and feet. Anybody else? Other symptoms include headache, dry mouth, excessive sweating, hot flashes, or grinding your teeth. Here we go, big one, sleep. Difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, also known as insomnia. Am I touching anybody right now? <laughs> Anxiety can also cause changes in sex drive, make it difficult to concentrate or think about anything but that which is the present worry. None of us would argue what I just read. We wouldn't argue it. We'd go, yeah, absolutely. I've been so stressed it's made my stomach hurt before. I've been so stressed it's given me a headache before. I've been so stressed that it's caused me to be short of breath. I've been so worried about something that I just didn't know what to do, so I didn't do anything. I just sat in bed covered up with the blankets and ate a pint of ice cream. It was all I had. <laughs> but when God says, if you'll turn this stuff over, I'll heal your body. We go, I don't know. You know the opposite is true. Most of us live it at some sort of some time or another, some season or another. But God says, if you will not be wise in your own eyes, and you will fear me and you will trust me, then that that I will bring healing to your flesh and replenishment to your bones is literally therapeutic. God's going, I can give you therapy for your stress, your anxiety, and your worry. How do you do that? Give it to me. Give it to me. Worry and stress, all of that come from one thing. It's control. The reason we worry and stress is because we can't fix it. We can't control it. We don't know what to do, and since we don't have the power to pull the string or move the puppet, we get freaked out. And God says, hey, it wasn't yours to freak out about. It's mine. Trust me, and I'll heal your body. I'll heal your soul. I will heal, replenish, restore your flesh and your bones. God says, look, son, Solomon's going, son, it, I, I want you to get this right early because if you don't get it right early, it'll bury you later. I need you to know how to deal with the stress and the stuff of this world. And the first thing you need to know is don't be wise in your own eyes. Trust the Lord. You cannot, you cannot figure it out. And I know some of you are like, yes, I can. You can't. And I know you really want to argue with me. You can't. It wasn't built for you to figure out. It was built. You were built to trust him. 
everything that you and I are is reliant on God being who he is. Air, substance, supply, all of it. If he's not who he is, I don't stand a chance. And so Solomon says, son, if you get this right early, don't lean into your own understanding. Don't lean into your own understanding. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil stuff, and trust me, and I'll heal your body. There's physical healing in it. Second thing, finances. Here we go, he gets into this. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all that you produce. Here's the, the promise. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Verse nine and 10. It's two things we see here. He says, honor the Lord with your wealth. That's financial decisions, not just what you give. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with your first fruits. This is the part where you give to the church, where you're generous and you're, and you're tithing or whatever it is. It's a biblical principle. It's not me just harping on your money. It's in here. Honor the Lord. But here's the problem. We buy into the lie. Here's the cycle. Let me give you the unhealthy cycle of what we do with our finances and with our wealth. This is what it looks like. We don't trust. And because we don't trust, we live in fear. And we're constantly anxious and we're constantly freaking out about where the next thing is coming from because we didn't get enough money at the end of our month and we just don't know what to do. And so what do we do? We consume. That's what we do. People that are in debt, they just get more debt. People that don't have enough money, they just kind of find a way to get more money, which is consuming. They're going to get more money and they might not always do it in a wise way. And that's just what they're going to do. And then what that produces is lack. Even though I spent more money, I don't have anything. And so what happens? We go, God, where have you been? Why'd you leave me hanging? Here I am. I'm hungry. I don't know what to do. I can't buy my kids shoes. I can't do this. I can't do that. Got a 65 inch, but I can't get this stuff taken care of. And so we distrust. And then because we distrust, we function out of fear, we continue to consume, we continue to have lack, and then we distrust, and this cycle just keeps going. Some of you didn't know that there was a picture that described how it's been going. But Solomon says, son, let me, let me, get, this, let me get this for you really quick. I need you to hear me on this. This is what I need you to do. I need you to change the cycle. Honor, honor the Lord with your wealth. Honor the Lord with your wealth. Then you will learn to trust him. As you trust him, you'll be generous towards him. As you're generous towards him, the only result of generosity throughout all of scripture is blessing. Malachi says, see that I won't open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you that you cannot contain. Generosity leads to blessing. Blessing leads to more honor, honor to more trust, trust to generosity, generosity to blessing. And we start spinning that wheel. And the reality of your finances and honoring God with your finances or your wealth or whatever word you want to use there. You're like, Pastor Vince, I don't have any wealth. If you have anything, you have wealth. You drove here in a vehicle that probably had heat and air, or at least the knob on the window. Not, does anybody in here, did you drive a car this morning that still had a knob that rolled down the window? Anybody? You see how far we've come? This is the cycle, and we get buried by it. And he says, look, if you'll learn to trust me in this, your barns will be full, that's supply. The things that you need go in the barn. Food, grain, substance, that's what goes in the barn. And your vats will be full. Over and above the stuff that you need. I got you. But the system is this way, son. And if you don't get it early, if you don't get it early, he says, son, if you'll get this early, this will be the thing that helps you build and gives you resource. But if you don't get it early, it will be the shovel that buries you. And then the last thing. Verse 11 and 12, he says, my son, don't despise the Lord's discipline. Don't shy away from his reproof. 
Because the Lord reproves him that he loves. I can almost see him pausing here and looking at his kid going, just like a father. You're who I delight in. You're who I find my delight in. You, me and my kids, they're my everything. Like they're, they're what get to carry the legacy that God has given me. And I don't mean pastoring a church. I mean following Jesus. And I delight in them. They make me laugh. They make me smile. They, they, they frustrate me, sure. But they are my delight. Mine and Jennifer's delight is in the household he's given us. And so I, I need you to understand that when I, when I, when I lean into you, it's, it's for you. It's not just because I'm against you and want your world to be miserable. It's because I'm for you. It's because there's something better for you if you'll trust me, if you'll follow, if you'll just lean in a little bit. I promise there's something better than the direction you're going. Any of you parents had this conversation with your kids? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. No, no, no. Come back over here. If you'll do this, it's better. I promise it's better. I've been down the road. It's better. But we do the same thing with God. You and I, we do the same thing with our Heavenly Father. I'm going to ask you a real simple question. See, before I gave you really, hey, here's the therapy that God offers through trusting Him. Here's the cycle that God offers you in generosity if you'll trust Him. But this last part, son, don't deny it when God leans into you. I'm going to ask you to bow with me. No one looking around. Just you and God for a few minutes. What is the Lord asking you to stop doing? What is the Lord asking you to stop doing? Some of you right now, the moment I asked the question, it came to your mind. You know exactly what it is that God has been telling you. Hey, 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 cut it out. That's not my plan for you. I have better in store. Stop, stop settling for this in your life. Stop, stop being okay with this. I need you to just fix this. Just stop doing that. You, you keep saying you want more of me. But me and that thing can't take up the same space. So I need you to stop so that I can come in, so that I can be more in your life, so that I can be evident in your life, so that I can be part of those decisions and those moments. But I need you to, I need you to stop doing this. Right now, no one looking around. No one but me. I'm going to ask you right now. If you know what it is that God has been asking you, or maybe he just asked you this morning. Maybe just now he made it clear to you and said, hey, this is the thing. I need you, I need you to stop doing this. And he's leaning into you about it right now. If you know what that is, I don't want you to say it out loud. I don't want you to do anything like that. What I want you to do is just acknowledge it and go, Pastor Vince, I know what it is. If that's you and you know what it is, can you just lift your hand and put it right back down? Come on, straight up, straight back down. Straight up, straight back down. Yeah, I see it. It's everywhere. We all know. And this God, this Father God that we serve, he has the ability to check you in a much more direct way. But instead, by grace, by grace, he, he reproves. He says, hey, this is something that needs to change in your life. This is something that needs to change in your life. I'm going to ask you today, give it to the Lord. Whatever he's asking you, 
give it to him. You say, Pastor Vince, I don't know if I can do it alone. Then you call us. You come up here and see us. You find somebody to connect with. We have, we have people that are willing to sit with you and talk with you. We have people that are willing to walk alongside you. But don't, don't just push it away. Don't just push it away. God has something great in store for you. Father, I love you. And Jesus, I thank you for your grace and for your mercy and for your love. God, I pray that those hands that went up, and I know, God, I know there are more people that know than hands that went up. And Lord, my prayer is that you would continue to lean on them. God, that you would continue to reprove, that you would exhort them to confession, God, that you would exhort them to repentance, and then they would move beyond this so that they can learn to live in the fear of the Lord and to trust you in all their ways and lean not to their own understandings. But in all their ways, they would acknowledge you and you, God, would follow through with your promise and make their paths clear. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.